Good morning, good morning, good morning. What, angry? No 360? No. I'll tell you why, it's not, we, we are gonna go over to 360. This is the camera, by the way. In case you haven't seen one. It's, uh, it's basically just like a little Wally type thing. But it's, uh, at the moment, I've got no way of securing it in the car. Yesterday I had it on a tripod and <laughs> it kept falling over as you probably saw. <coughs> Excuse me, still haven't quite shaken that cough from the cold. And uh, so I need a way to sort of fix it to the dashboard, you know, or to the windscreen, probably to the windscreen. I said to uh, Mrs. Angry, I was gonna stick it on with some blue tack and she said, you'll never, you'll never stick it to the, what's it, she said there. Uh, they're made of a special plastic. You can't stick things to dashboard plastic. It's special. <laughs> it's like it's like Teflon. It's like like I've got like a mobile frying pan. Just can't stick anything to anything. So anyway, we'll um, we're working on that. We'll have to wait until we come back with a some sort of. Uh, there might be a bendy tripod that uh, I can sort of stick up there that won't fall over or. Or some sort of thing that will take um, I suppose there's like a, a GoPro mount that's got a camera screw on it but but three suckers that go on the dashboard that's probably the answer the problem with the 360 camera is that uh, it, it's going to sort of if the mount is because it, it's bi-directional if it's the mount it's going to stop it seeing forwards then you're going to lose the benefit of the 360 the only thing you can really put a 360 camera on is a stick, like a selfie stick, because the stick is in its blind spot, and so it, you know you then get the proper 360 picture. But I don't know whether I'll be able to find a selfie stick that will stand up. It'd be better off with perhaps with some sort of a tripod. Anyway, the um, from rendering the uh, picture, it looks like the. Actually, the thing that takes all the time is the stitching because it, it has two like circular images. It has two fisheye images front and back, and then it has to put them together, stretch them, and stitch them around the edges to create a sphere. And that takes that is what takes the time. And I think you know it's about well, it's not a massive amount of time, but it might be about 40, 45 minutes for a 15. No, no, it was a six-minute clip, wasn't it? It was about six minutes. So. 10 minutes so yeah so it's about four or five to one the ratio of time time to stitch but then once you've edited it then um, actually rendering it and uploading it to YouTube doesn't take that long uh, the rendering use is what takes the time on these sort of videos um, what else can I tell you about 360 photography um, you can. I've got a like a 256 gigabyte uh, megabyte card in it, and that gives me about nine hours recording, which is you know is far too much. You know, I mean that card's far too big. Um, but it was only 40 quid, and um, the the battery itself only lasts recording about an hour. So I mean, it's not like. I mean, if you were taking the whole thing on, on holiday, then obviously the card would be big enough, providing you just kept recharging the, the camera. And the camera tends to be, um, you know, you don't really want massive, great, long clips. By the time, you know, someone's had a chance to work out what's going on and uh, have a look around, you know, and see what else is going on, then they want to move on, you know. And it's quite, I found myself quite good, because it's immersive in that you jump from location to location. So it's like teleporting. You know, you are you can be like, uh, one minute you're in the surgery and then the next minute you're in someone's garden and you can look around and then, then you sort of, you know, you're on the <laughs> not to know, you're up the top of a mountain or somewhere. Uh, it does put you in the, in the picture sort of, uh, literally, quite literally. So. Anyway, um, as soon as I find a way of uh, securing that, then that's probably, we'll go over to that. And the, the other thing you could do, I mean, if you had a mount, is you can just use one lens. So for example, you can you can just get your input either from the front lens or the back lens, and uh, not the other one. 
in which case you know then basically what you've got is a very wide angle GoPro type camera for well it's got it's quite a reasonable price it's about 220 pounds but there's quite a few uh, problems that you know the software you have to really hunt around to get the software because this is an updated version of an old model and the software that worked with the old model is not appropriate for this model so you have to sort of almost hack around in the Samsung website to try and find the software and then um, and then uh, well anyway it's just you know I mean I also it only works with Samsung phones really so if you've got a Nexus 5 or something or a 5X or any sort of an other Android phone it, you don't get a lot of the functionality such as the preview and the live streaming and everything you can't do um, so it's squarely in the Samsung ecosystem in the same way as Apple tried to <clears throat> keep everybody in the Apple Apple ecosystem by you know making the messaging only compatible with other Apple devices and all that stupid all that stupidity that AOL tried to get away with and CompuServe tried to get away with in the early days you know the the walled gardens these companies are always trying to set up walled gardens and Samsung whose whose last phone was you know like widely regarded as the next best thing to have on a flight if you haven't got a hand grenade and had to be recalled uh, the, the exploding S7 they've now decided that building on that success that they're going to try and force people to have a Samsung everything so it's a Samsung camera and it works with the gear Samsung Gear VR virtual headset which is compatible with the Oculus Rift and uh, and their, their gear 360 software which is only runs on the Samsung S6 7 and 8 S7 deceased right let's see what's going on at the junction of death Death to the left of him, death to the right of him. Oh, there's a lot of death coming that way, I'll have to wait. So anyway, yeah, yesterday I had made a gold crown for someone. Woohoo! And, uh, you know, gold crowns are, are sort of... Th this is a guy who's got like about six upper teeth. He's got his two upper centrals and, and, and a few molars and everything, and, but he's quite happy tried dentures a couple of times didn't didn't like them as in didn't mind you know this he's an electrician doesn't mind walking around with no teeth it's part of his personality uh, but obviously the rest of them are quite overloaded so we did a gold crown on on the upper right six and um, and <clears throat> what I was going to talk about was technicians really and technical work because um, <clears throat> It's getting, it's getting, it is quite difficult to find a decent technician. As in, I mean, you know, like I trained in the 70s and, you know, we, we, the, obviously the emphasis was on occlusion and uh, uh, contact points and occlusal uh, detail, you know, the correct occlusal detail and lateral excursions and things like that so so when I sort of sort of get, got back into the profession again a couple of years ago I decided to um, find out who the best technician was you know I mean we were a private practice and we wanted the best technician so um, it turns out there's only two technicians really in the area that are usable and this is a this is a reflection on you know Mr. Cockcroft's <laughs> the, the night of a thousand the long knives, where uh, the uh, you know technicians marched into that contract to their death, and so they've all gone. And it's not been helped by the fact that obviously there's been a lot of consolidation in the dental profession as well. In that um, there's far more dentistry provided by dental groups now, you know, or so-called bodies corporate. And <clears throat> when these guys get above a critical size and they get fed up with dealing with technicians then they <clears throat> tend to want to bring the lab work in-house they go through phases of sort of buying it in the market to trying to force the prices down in the market by saying well yeah we're sending you a lot of volume 
and then they say to the technicians, well, uh, you know, we are only going to deal with technicians who've got this accreditation and that accreditation, and so they force the technicians to go get all their damn ass stuff and, you know, jump through a load of, load of meaningless hoops to get bits of paper, expensive bits of paper, and then finally they, um, when they sort of put in quite a bit of work through one technician, because he's the only technician who's jumped through all the hoops, they then say, well, why are we putting all our work through your, uh, this external lab when we could have an internal lab, you know, that handled all that volume? And so you get the old, uh, you know, the farmer selling all his produce to Sainsbury's type problem where the technician goes from having loads of work to having none. <laughs> and sitting and left around, sitting, uh, his walls covered with all these expensive frames with expensive certificates in and no work coming through the door. So, Anyway, so we've got these two technicians, and um, I've been uh, having problems getting the quality of work that I want. And by quality, I mean, I don't mean, in my, what well, in my opinion is unreasonable quality, I mean just crowns that look like teeth, you know? I don't want crowns that look like crowns. I don't want, you know, even if the average member of the public accepts that someone's teeth are all different colours because that's how their teeth are. I, as a dentist, I don't want to look at someone and, and be able to say straight away, yeah, that's the crown. That is a crown. That is a crown. That, that sort of Armitage Shanks approach to crown work is not acceptable, <laughs> in my opinion. So, I want, and my patients want, crowns that look like teeth. So you've got a cosmetic problem there, for a start, because the best cosmetic work I ever fitted was um, done by a guy in Maidstone called Alan Andrews, who had a lad there called Cosmetic Design. And the way we did it was we sent the patients across to the lab, and they, they had a little waiting area there where, you know, the patients used to sit and have a cup of tea and coffee, and um, then... Alan or one of the technicians would come through and he would look at their teeth and he would literally do a watercolour, you know, sort of quasi watercolour with, with crayons, with uh, coloured pencils, which was a sort of a, a meta language, <clears throat> which, were, you know, allowed him to describe and record to himself and the other technicians the nuances of the teeth, and teeth are very nuanced. If you look at them close up properly, you know, this is the old Vita, are they, are they B, B2 or A2 sort of question, We are, it's the only question that some people ask, uh, or possibly B3. Um, you know, th that leaves out the whole, the language of appearance, of teeth, which, which is what Alan recorded. <clears throat> now, the crowns he sent back were indistinguishable from the teeth that they were going up against, you know, so I was very happy with his work and and uh, used him for all the ground and bridge work. Now, outside of the sort of the major centres, perhaps Harley Street and Wimpole Street and places like that, it does seem to me that it's almost impossible to get this sort of skill on a local level, and then that's because the NHS doesn't demand this sort of skill. They basically want a tooth to cover the cover the prep reasonably sealed around the edges and and basically uh, as long as it looks like a uh, whitish then that's fine so what's happened is that the, the either the technicians who had these skills have moved on to other things or more likely retired or uh, haven't passed on their skills to the new guys so the new guys are just they're doing these horrible things that chiclets type crowns so so appearance is one so um, but the technicians themselves are reluctant to look at the teeth you know if you say to a technician you know would you like to pop round and um, have a look at the patient in the in the in the chair you know or shall I send the patient round to you it's oh no 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 that won't be necessary or even, you know, shall I take some photos of the teeth? Or what I'd, I'd ideally love to do, which is to take some photos of the bloody crowns after they're fitted and send them to the technicians and say, look, here is your crown. 
in the mouth. What do you think? What do you think? You know? To which the answer is, I've already been paid. I don't think anymore. Because I'm not paid to think. So, that's, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you, short of recruiting a technician and getting him to work on site and training him up yourself, how do you solve that problem, that quality problem? And then the other problem is the articulation, you know, the bite. Because the, the vast majority of technicians, I think, I mean, most of them don't even own an articulator. And this is, this is not unique to the technical profession because the vast majority of dentists probably don't own an articulator. But <clears throat> this crown I got back yesterday was obviously cosmetics was not an issue and the bite was not an issue. And the, the way I checked this was I took the plaster cast that the technician had cast up and I articulated them with my bite so that I put together these plaster casts in the bite that I sent to the technician and then put his crown on to see how closely his crown f approximated to the bite that I had sent him. And sure enough, it was slightly low on the bite, which is actually, I don't, you know, obviously it's infinitely preferable being slightly high on the bite. But the problem was that in one of the lateral excursions, it had a massive great interference. And this is because what he'd done was, in trying to make me a private crown, and uh, you know, like a really, really nice looking, tooth looking, a lovely occlusal pattern crown, of which, I mean, to be honest with you, a lot of technicians don't even know what the occlusal pattern is on a crown, especially on an upper six. I mean, they, you know, they don't know about the cusps, where the cusps go. So what they do is they just make a load of, uh, they make it look like the Swiss Alps, you know. <laughs> like, Swiss Alps, gotta be good. <laughs> so, so I got this crown back that looked like the Swiss Alps. And unfortunately, one of the Alps was <laughs> was interfering with the lat lateral excursion. Now, the technician wouldn't have known that because the way he'd articulated these models was just to pour them up in plaster and trim them up and stick these bloody plastic hinges on the back. And they don't even stick them so that the, the model opens like a hinge would. They stick them at some weirdly absurd angle so that the whole the whole thing sort of sort of doesn't look like it fits together but when you put it together it sort of at the last minute it comes together like a gull wing like a like a like a funny gull wing door on a car or something that just sort of you know or <laughs> just doesn't you know it's not in the plane of the TMJs these hinges and they've got about a half a milli half a centimeter of movement on them you know they're not tight or anything so in short, really, they're only they're only really designed to uh, approximate the teeth in centric. When the when the two models are in centric, then you've got a chance that they're accurate. But in any other movement other than completely shut in centric, they are they are by definition wrong. So there's no way you can check lateral excursion or anything, even taking advantage of the liberal amount of lateral movement in these hinges assuming that they were set on straight uh, you might might conceivably able to slide the jaws a bit but uh, not the way that he's put them on you just can't slide them laterally so there we are with this massive great I mean which aggravated me not least because of the gold that's wasted <laughs> I hate grinding gold I know I hate it you know it goes all over the surgery gold goes all over my gown and so I just had to grind this cusp off and I did it on the articulator before the patient arrived and then checked it in the mouth and then polished it up and then hey presto one one perfect crown but where am I I'm no further am I I'm no further towards my goal of having the perfectly aesthetic perfectly balanced in lateral occlusion crown because I just can't find a technician that is you know does that sort of work and they are, once again, shooting themselves in the foot, these, these guys, because the small independent technician, right, the guy who could do this sort of work to this level, his only future, his future is not going to be with the corporates. The corporates are not going to employ these, these artists 
they are going to be they are going to work in conjunction with uh, private dentists and at the very highest level you know the sort of the, the guys who go around lecturing at FDI meetings stuff like that it's a one-to-one -one basis it's one dentist one technician and the dentist only sends his work to that technician and the technician only does the work of that one dentist and that's that's the future to build up that sort of relationship with a technician but when you know when when he's sort of trying to work in the health service and thinks that a crown that looks about right and bites nearly correctly and 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 doesn't care about lateral excursion because with NHS crowns all you're expected to do is be able to eat by chopping up and down um, you know centric you know when they say is it high on the bite is it a bit high on the bite they mean incentric that's it and then that's grounding in centric and that's it you know that's that's high on the bite is high and centric so what's he gonna do what's he gonna do I mean I can't I can't fit NHS crowns on my private patients honestly I can't I'm gonna have to I'll have, I will have to take on a technician and train him up personally if that's how it goes but I wish some of these uh, small independent technicians would just wake up and smell the coffee and realize that the way the way the way forward for them was the way forward for the profession you know the way forward for the profession wasn't wasn't to, to keep lowering standards and remain in a sort of a, a horizontal market and just put put pressure down with pressure on standards all the time which is what the health service is doing it was to, to have a vertical market to have to realize that you know there's a patient up here that wants this then and then the patient wants a bit less other patient wants a bit less some patient wants a health service and you have to move up vertically up the market vertically and uh, that's where the space is there's headroom in this profession there's no there's no room between you and the floor well there's a lot of room between you and the ceiling okay all right so I'll let you know how I get on anyway with my quest for the perfect crown. And uh, 360, as soon as I can. All right, bye.